Hello, I'm your host, Brian Callanan. From setting a minimum wage for app-based workers to establishing a new hiring incentive program for police officers and ramping up investments in affordable housing, there's plenty on the agenda for the Seattle City Council. I'm talking with council members Lisa Herbold and Teresa Mosqueda about those issues, and I'm asking the questions you're sending in, too. It's all coming up on Council Edition. Workers need to understand what the details are associated with individual gigs so that they can make choices. Housing should be first and foremost on every Seattleite's mind in terms of asking how we can do more in this area. All that and more coming up next on City Inside Out, Council Edition. And here they are, Council Member Lisa Herbold from District 1 and Citywide Council Member Teresa Mosqueda. Thank you both for joining me here. I wanted to get into this with you, Council Member Herbold, first, uh, asking about the pay up legislation you've been working on to establish a minimum wage and other protections for gig workers. We're recording this just after pay up was voted out of committee and it's now headed to this full council vote. However, I knew a lot of amendments were flying around at this recent committee meeting on this. Do you anticipate we're going to see more of those or what's the final version of pay up going to look like? I hope it's going to look much like what came out of committee. Um, we offered um, non-committee members the opportunity to propose uh, amendments uh, so that we could really uh, ensure that the package coming out of the committee looks pretty similar to what will be heard in, in full council. Um, you know, we did see a lot of amendments, um, and a lot of those amendments were amendments that were suggested by the um, app-based platforms themselves, mm -hmm. uh, despite um, I, I don't want to suggest that they're, uh, that by amending the bill to reflect their input, um, everybody's on board, but I think it's also really important that we, that we did incorporate a lot of their input on a lot of different issues. Mm -hmm. Got it. And in terms of the upshot of what's going to come out of this legislation, can you touch on that briefly? Sure. It's, um, you know, it just covers three, three primary issues. And the, the one that I think people are talking most about is the uh, commitment to a, a minimum wage that, that covers the city's minimum wage, as well as people's costs associated uh, with doing the work, the the money that they have to pay out of their own pocket in order to um, to do this this gig work, that has to be covered because otherwise people aren't making minimum wage. The other two sort of overarching uh, principles are um, a commitment to policies that promote transparency, so that. Um, customers, uh, businesses, and the workers themselves um, understand the relationship and understand what they're paying for, or what, what, what people are receiving uh, compensation for the workers. Mm -hmm. and, and then finally, flexibility. Uh, people talk about gig work, uh, pr uh, promoting and preserving flexibility. But uh, in order to really uh, enshrine that principle of flexibility, um, workers need to understand what the details are um, associated with individual gigs so that they can make choices. Um, and making choices about whether or not to take um, a, a gig is yeah. is a fundamental principle of that flexibility. Got it. Thank you. Uh, Council Member Mosqueda, I know you put in some amendments yourself to pay up. Uh, where do you want to guide this legislation? Well, I'm just very excited to be a supporter of Council Member uh, Herbold's, and I know that she has done tremendous work over the last few years nice. to try to get as much feedback as possible from stakeholders. I think that the time is now to pass such legislation. The rise of independent contractor work, the prevalence of gig work in our economy means that many people who we deemed as essential, workers who we called heroes in the last two years, they need labor protections. And this legislation is intended to be one piece of the puzzle to provide greater transparency and accountability. And I think um, truly try to build back in labor protections for a whole swath of workers who've been largely left out. And notably, workers in the gig economy um, are 
more likely to be workers of color, mm. immigrants and refugees, and a lot of folks who've been out there on the front line, literally putting their health and their family's health at risk. So for me, I'm very excited that the legislation is moving forward. I know stakeholder work has happened from the local to the national level, and um, I will be happy to be a supporter in the end here as it gets across the finish line. All right, a lot, lot still ahead with that, but I know we're seeing some, some progress there for sure. Councilmember Mosqueda, back to you for a question about finance and housing, the committee that you chair. So the committee's ramping up some investments into the Office of Housing, as a, adding a dozen new employees there as the city works towards this effort to renew the housing levy next year. Two questions here, if you could. What are these new employees going to be doing here? And second, are you anticipating the housing levy will need to be increased substantially next year or what's going on? Thanks, Brian, for this question. You know, housing should be first and foremost on every Seattleite's mind in terms of asking how we can do more in this area. It is the reason why we continue to see more folks live unsheltered in this community because we don't have enough housing. And what we have done in the last four years since I've been on council is move from an investment annually of around 50 million. That's what it was in 2016, 52 million dollars in affordable housing. Last year, we hit 200 million dollars in investment and affordable housing. That came from about half, $97 million coming from Jumpstart Progressive Payroll Tax, and about at about $76 million coming from the mandatory housing fees. We have done a lot of work to try to make sure that there's more funding and to expedite funding going into developing affordable housing led by community organizations who are most impacted by displacement. Folks from communities of color who are seeking uh, to invest in building housing for those who've been left behind and left without affordable housing options. In order for us to keep up with the need in Seattle right now for affordable housing, we need to increase the amount of the housing levy, which was authorized at 260 million in 2016. We need to at least bring that to 400 million to keep up with today's need. You'll hear from community across the board. They'd like to see that number tripled. We know we have the need. So it's really a question of how much funding can we bring in? How, how much can we ask for from the voters? And every single penny that is brought in from the levy will go to complement the funding that we have from Jumpstart. Uh, this is a matter of making sure that we have the resources to meet the most pressing need in Seattle. And in terms of the staff, Jumpstart when we passed it, and let's remember we passed and codified a spend plan in statute to make sure that everyone knew where those dollars were going. Mm -hmm. We authorized 5% of the funding to be used for administration, for staff to implement things like new home ownership opportunities, building new affordable units, making sure that we're creating opportunity for building housing coupled with community um, opportunities. Mm -hmm. And of that 5% that Office of Housing is allowed to use, they're only using 2.3%. The rest going into affordable housing, both rental and new home ownership opportunities. So it's really about actualizing the vision of Jumpstart and making sure that housing is being developed. Got it. Thank you for that. Council Member Herbold, you uh, are vice chair on this committee here. And I wanted to talk about something uh, happening in the background here. A group gathering signatures right now for a city initiative we potentially vote on later on this year about social housing, housing that would be owned by the city, subsidized depending on render, renter income there. I'm just trying to look ahead. If that made the ballot and passed with that compete with the housing levy or how would that impact Seattle's affordable housing efforts? Nobody's really been able to explain to me um, what social housing is that makes it unique as opposed to the housing that is being built by our nonprofit partners. The research I've done um, is really about um, uh, and about social housing. It's really about a governance model where uh, tenants are um, part of a governing entity that makes decisions about the housing that's being built and how it's run. And I really believe that we can incorporate that model if we wanna try out that model of, of how, we, how affordable housing is governed we could try that within the, the housing levy. I don't um, think we need to have a new public development authority um, in order in order to try that governing model out. Now, some people have also suggested that social housing, even though I'm, I don't find that in my research of, of what social housing is, some people have suggested it also should be um, serving higher incomes um, of folks as well so that the higher income rents can help finance the lower income rents mm -hmm. and that our current model of affordable housing doesn't allow for that um, and the idea being that we should use our um, we should use our uh, well a 
a new development authority would use their bonding capacity mm -hmm. in order to build more housing and then use the rent from the higher income units to pay off the debt service uh, around the bond capacity. I'm a huge fan of using our debt capacity, mm -hmm. our, our, our bonding authority yeah. to build affordable housing. And I think we can do that with the models that we have already. Got it. Uh, Council Member Mosqueda, any thoughts on this? I wanted to make sure I brought it up. Well, I think what we have done in Seattle is really show how much housing we can invest in with a voter approved levy. The housing levy, I don't want to get lost in the conversation. We were the first city and one of the only cities to make sure that we created affordable housing funding from voters. And we really need voters to see how those dollars have been put to good use leading up to the November 2023 election. I want to be you know, shouting from the rooftops with community across the board to show that the 2016 levy has already led to more than anticipated housing than we thought. 126% of the promised rental units, 115% of the home ownership opportunities, and we still have two years to go. In our region, we simply don't have enough funding. And the funding question, right, the funding question is what is going to allow for us to do more creative options in terms of policy. In King County alone, we know that we need between $450 million to a $1 billion a year, mm. a billion dollars a year to invest in the housing that our community needs right now. So as more folks move here as immigrants and refugees, as climate refugees seeking a more stable environment, as mm -hmm. workers and small business folks who are setting up their own shops and looking for mm -hmm. good living wage jobs as economic refugees, and frankly now as folks who are coming here hopefully able to seek abortion services, if things go poorly with the Supreme Court, we need to provide a home for those who are coming to our region. And uh, that is what we don't have enough of funding to build that home. Uh, thank you very much for that. I wanted to make sure I stuck with you, Council Member Mosqueda, to talk specifically about Jumpstart payroll tax. You brought this up earlier. 62% of the revenue from that is supposed to go towards affordable housing. But I know also we're looking at a budget gap here, and the mayor's been looking at that because it's exceeded expectations in terms of bringing in revenue this year. And he's saying, well, maybe that head toward, heads towards the budget, budget gap. I'm asking because you're the budget chair here, your thoughts about that and maybe some of the other work you're doing when it comes to progressive revenue on the council right now. Great, thank you. Yeah, we're very thankful that um, the council passed uh, the Jumpstart Progressive Payroll Tax in 2020. Folks might not remember all those details because it was the first month that COVID hit that we started talking about Jumpstart. And we passed that within the first three months of the pandemic. Council Member Herbal, the co-sponsor of that, we made sure that we were looking at progressive revenue options, a payroll tax only on the largest companies with more than 7 million in Seattle payroll and only on the largest salaries, over 150,000 in terms of salaries. So it's a progressive, progressive tax. Mm. Uh, we are very thankful that um, we have a great Office of Financial and Administrative Services that worked with payors to make sure that it was implementable and people mm. have been paying. Yes, it is coming in higher than anticipated, but we had conservative estimates that we built our budget and our projections on to make sure that we weren't overestimating what could be brought in. And these are items that have been long overdue. Investments in affordable housing, where 62% of the funding goes. Investments in equitable development initiative, economic resilience, Green New Deal items items that have been constantly put on the back burner. So we codified in statute the importance of those investments so that they wouldn't constantly be back burner. That's why we have such a situation that we have with housing, because you want to address the immediate needs in front of you. But we got to be thinking about these long term issues like housing and Green Deal investments. We also put into that um, statute, though, a valve. If revenues did not keep up with the needs, we could potentially look at that as an area for making sure that we we're avoiding austerity budgeting. So the question that we have for central staff and for our city budget office, shout out to Julie Dingley, the new director. We're looking at general fund adjacent revenue streams to see where we could potentially have some flexibility. Because I think that at the end of the day, Vice Chair Herbold and myself want to make sure we avoid austerity budgeting and that we also prioritize much needed services that had been backwarded in the in in the past. So I think we're we're going to see some more information come in by August and we'll have a better uh, answer to your question more directly about the use of Jumpstart. That's fair. And Council Member Herbal, I just wanted to make sure I got your thoughts on trying to fill a budget gap for the city. I know you faced this issue, issue as a budget chair for the council in the past. What's your perspective on this? Um, as 
Mr. Chair Mosqueda mentioned, I, I, I want to have all the information. Um, I, I really, um, I'm reserving um, coming to any conclusions um, about about Jumpstart until I have a fuller revenue picture. Um, I do recognize that in the in 2021, we uh, created we we used that flexibility that we gave ourselves um, to make sure that we did not um, reduce funding for important programs or or mm -hmm. layoff staff. And um, if if the revenue keeps coming in at higher rates, um, I, I think it's reasonable to um, ask that question again um, around the use of that flexibility for the. I would say limiting it to the additional revenue mm. um, up above and beyond what we anticipated coming in um, okay. while maintaining our commitment, our strong commitment to the funding plan for the uh, the anticipated revenue. But uh, just look forward to uh, following the, the lead of our very able budget chair on these discussions. All right. Thank you. I know there's a lot, a lot of work still ahead on that. Council Member Herbold, let me stick with you here. The council recently passed an ordinance that you sponsored to hire a police recruiter, set aside some money for relocation funding. Uh, funding for this would come from money the SPD will be saving on police salaries, as it appears the department will not reach its goal of hiring 125 officers this year. The council also approved a resolution from Council Member Nelson about hiring bonuses for officers. So SPD, as we all know, has been losing officers pretty steadily over the past couple of years. What do you hope the impact of these measures is going to be? Sure. Um, so the I think the uh, impact of Councilmember Nelson's res resolution is just merely signaling that the council is willing to consider um, a package that the mayor will bring us at a later date um, and consider a, a package of strategies that will address the need to recruit officers and also retain the officers that we currently have. It doesn't bless any particular strategy. Um, I think there's wide variety of opinions on the council of what kind of um, staffing incentives um, or um, recruitment incentives work. Um, people minds always seem to go to the traditional bonus program mm -hmm. where the city writes a check to thank somebody for coming to work for us. Um, mm -hmm. But there are a lot of other types of, um, of staffing incentives that I know the mayor's office is considering to increase recruitment. There are other types of, um, of retention incentives that are also being considered within the context of our contract negotiations with the police department officers. Mm -hmm. um, and so the resolution is, I, I believe, is merely signal si signaling a willingness to consider a future proposal that we will get from uh, Mayor Harrell. The um, ordinance, the, the council bill that will become an ordinance uh, that the council voted on is to um, support some very specific strategies. And one of those strategies is um, allowing the city, multiple departments across the city, not only the police department, to think about um, how we can move away from only offering uh, to compensate people for their relocation costs only to high end um, earners, the, the de department directors, but how we might wanna um, provide that opportunity for hiring managers to recruit people from other other cities, other 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 locations, mm -hmm. and pay them for the relocation costs. That should not be something that only um, high end recruits um, are getting. Folks who are already going to be making um, a, a generous salary. Got it. Okay, uh, Councilmember Mosqueda, I know you opposed the ordinance and the resolution in front of the council here, along with Council Members Morales and Sawan. Uh, why was that? First, I want to make sure that we're not re-engaging in the debate that council has already had. Uh, as right. I said in the committee meeting uh, yesterday, you know, I really consider Councilmember Herbold a not only thought partner in how we're addressing alternatives to community safety, but a leader in how we've made investments in the budget together and policy changes to make sure that we have alternative responses. Um, on this on this ordinance and the resolution specifically, I think it's a difference of opinion on whether or not a proviso, for example, should be lifted specifically on the Seattle Police Department when we know that there is a, that budget gap that we talked about just a moment ago. If we 
we do have funding at the end of the year, um, my preference would have been to have a more robust conversation about whether things like uh, moving fees or hiring incentives of any kind could have been factored in across the board, which I really appreciate that this looks at other departments as well. How do we factor in what our city frontline workers have been calling for for a long time? And that's investments in training and apprenticeship opportunities, helping to make sure that BIPOC workers uh, get a career advancement and um, thinking about how we can do more to provide uh, opportunity uh, for folks to feel like they have a safe work environment and also for there to be childcare for recruitment and retention needs. A lot of these items have come up from our Coalition for City Union folks. This is, um, I'm sure, going to continue to be a conversation that they want to engage in, especially in the wake of COVID. In a post-pandemic world, hopefully one day, because this is still not post-pandemic, we have to have a conversation about how the city responds to the great resignation and also, I think, a call for workers' voices and ideas to be front and center about how retention and recruitment is considered in our hiring uh, policies. Workers are uniting and organizing across the country. And this is a chance for us to really show uh, leadership as as employers to think about where investments could be made over the years to improve retention and recruitment. So conversation is still to come. And in terms of um, what the funding situation looks like at the end of the year, again, wanting to make sure that all dollars were in hand at the end of the year is really important. Uh, And then lastly, you know, I think, the, the executive has additional funding in there for recruitment of a police chief and a re- retention officer. Mm-hmm. I think that there's a, a lot of interest, and then I know Councilmember Herbal shares this with me, a lot of interest in making sure that we're not just thinking about how do we recruit more officers? How do we get more money out for mental health service providers? Yeah. The individual at the pier who ended up getting shot would have been better served by a mental health provider. Mm -hmm. Charlene Lyles would have been better served by a mental health provider. So as we think about investments in our city, it has to be a both and, and that's the conversation that I'm sure we'll continue to have this fall. All right. Thank you for engaging on that. We have some questions about homelessness to send your way. Council member Herbold to you first. A viewer sent in this message about people camping in RVs after the recent announcement from SDOT that it would be enforcing its 72 hour parking rule. The message says this, Why aren't the RVs cleaned up already? The city implemented a 72-hour parking policy already, and there was a shooting. I believe the writer might be referring to a shooting at an RV encampment in your district, West Seattle, from a few weeks ago. Uh, Just your thoughts on this, the parking rule in RVs. I know you've been working on setting up some safe parking lots for RVs, too. Yes, thank you. Um, And also uh, with the leadership of Member Mosqueda, we have uh, jointly worked to provide funding to the Regional Homelessness Authority to establish a state law, uh, safe lot. The um, authority currently has a request for proposals for nonprofits to suggest how they might use this $1.9 million in funds to do so. And I'm really pleased that this work is, is moving forward. We, we need we need more. This is an essential step because really RV residents are a different group um, with different needs than other folks experiencing homelessness. They quite literally have a home. And um, if we are going to expect them to give up that home uh, for for something like shelter or a tiny house village, um, we have to address how um, they um, feel comfortable giving up what they see as a, a home that they, they already have. So I, I think having a safe lot is, um, is, another, is another strategy. But the bottom line is if we want something different to happen, different from the 72-hour law is enforced and uh, people who live in their RVs move their RVs and they go somewhere else or they come back to the location. If we want to see something different happen, we have to do something differently because otherwise the RVs that are on Andover now are going to be parking up at, um, on, on Harbor Ave. That's, you know, the other, the other location where we see, um, a lot of RVs they are going to go park in, in South park. So we really need to do something that we're not already doing. And I'm really hopeful that the, um, the RV fund, RV safe flat funding will will help provide that that alternative. Thank you for that, Councilmember Mosqueda. We had another email coming out on this too. Soon after the Woodland Park encampment was cleared out by the city, the writer says this: There seem to be two mindsets: sweep homeless people so they aren't allowed to camp anywhere, or allow homeless people to be wherever they want. 
Why isn't there a middle ground where the city or county designates locations where people can camp for free? Now, I know the city does have some authorized tent city encampments or whatever else, but any thoughts on this concept and what's happening with homelessness right now? Well, I think that we have done a lot of investments into short term emergency housing. Um, the idea that folks wouldn't stay in a, t in a tiny house for a long period of time, they wouldn't stay in emergency shelter for a, a long period of time. That is the intermediary between making sure that folks get into a house. Folks are still homeless if they are without a home, without a permanent home. So that sort of middle ground that we're trying to invest in, that is exactly what I think we've been uh, trying to do and put the money where the desire is. Council Member Herbal talked about uh, the, the safe lots, the RV safe lots. So as your listener noted, uh, if there is an interest in making sure that people have a safer place to be, and that is our interest as well, recognizing that many people who have a vehicle or an RV are probably not interested in giving up that vehicle, but we want them in a safer place. We put nearly $1.5 million into the concept of a safe law. We invested in the scoff law mitigation program last year, yet again, a program that council brought back from um, budget dust. We brought that back in, in the last two and three years to make sure that our scoff law mitigation program was being invested in so those who are living in their vehicles have a safer place to live. We just need to scale up those services as we also build affordable housing. Because a safe lot, a tiny house, it's still a temporary measure. And that's why we have so much of an emphasis, especially through Jumpstart, progressive payroll tax, into building that affordable housing so that people have exits from homelessness. Whether it's a shelter, a safe lot, or a tiny house, we need to keep getting folks into permanent housing. So we have done some of that investments in that um, safer place to be. But really, um, uh, the importance of getting people into a safe and sanctioned place uh, is good for their health. It's good for population health. And we know that many people who are currently unsheltered do want to move into a safer place. We just yep. need to scale up those resources much faster. Got it. I have about a minute left, but I wanted to touch on a public safety issue with you, Councilmember Herbold, if I could. So the plan, as it looks like here later in May, shut down the public beaches at Alki and Golden Gardens by no later than 10. Fire pits have to be out by 930. Sounds interesting, but I'm the dad of two teenage daughters. I can hear the pushback coming already. But dad, it's summertime. What, what are we supposed to do? Tell us about what the plan is here. Is this going to be something permanent in the future? What can you let us know about this? I think, um, you know, this is just replicating a plan that we've used before. We've had earlier closure hours in the past um, summers as well. Um, I represent residents at Alki, of course, and I hear regularly throughout the summer about the public safety issues there uh, when the park and community um, have a lot of visitors from around the city and the entire region. Uh, violence has uh, broken out on occasion. It, and that violence can be everything from dangerous driving on the streets to fights and gun violence. And so um, earlier closing times has helped in the past. I appreciate that Parks is uh, trying to walk a fine line here um, while promoting safety, but also maintaining a strong commitment to keep our public spaces open for public enjoyment. Got it. I All want right, to debut kids. something yeah. here if I can, Brian, Please, quickly, just yeah. as a, an idea for us to maybe build on. You know, we know that more people will enter into small businesses if there's more foot traffic, that they actually mm -hmm. have higher sales when there's foot traffic and, and more bikes. And we also know that, unfortunately, some of the uh, violence that we've seen along Alki have come from drive-by shooting. So I'm wondering if there's an opportunity here for us to have a longer term conversation about making that path in front of Alki a true pedestrian area mm -hmm. and and slowing the traffic so that just those who are residents or making deliveries can get through. Wouldn't that be so cool to make it more of a pedestrian activated area? And if that can help, along with increased lighting, making sure that we're activating public spaces and keeping the park open, uh, it could be a win-win. Okay. All right. Kids, listen to your council members. That's how I'm going to tell them. Thank you both for joining me here. And we will see you next time on Council Edition.